What's going on, everybody? This is Brayden from the Catechumen. Today, I am joined again with Swan Sona. Welcome back to the channel, sir. Hey, Brayden. Good to see you again. We did a live stream a little while ago on the um, open canon argument, uh, and you know we've had a little bit more time to talk about it and just flesh out our thoughts. And Swan has uh, some amazing graphics to share with us, and he's going to be sharing uh, his thoughts on the open canon argument uh, today. So. Uh, without further ado, Swan, uh, would you like to introduce what the open canon argument is uh, for those of us who don't know? Yeah, I'll, I'll get my uh, presentation open on my side, and you can just put it on the screen. And from there, uh, let's see, we'll, we'll get going. So like I mentioned last time, this was an argument that I thought about since uh, the debate between Gavin Ortland and Trent Horn. And it's a question actually that's been on my mind ever since I really started, you know, looking into textual criticism and questions related to the canon. And so this argument isn't meant to show that Protestantism is necessarily false or even that sola scriptura is necessarily false. Although I think it definitely gestures in the direction very strongly of sola scriptura being false. If you accept, and this is the key, if you accept that the canon is infallibly closed, if you come from a more, let's say, conservative theological background, I think this argument will have more sway. Whereas there are some scholars and there are some Christians out there who really do believe that the canon is fallibly closed, that it could be open, that there might be other divinely inspired books that didn't make it in historically. That is a position that I've heard some Christian scholars hold. But for the most part, I'm going to be assuming that I'm talking to someone who, let's say, at least agrees that the 27 books we have in the New Testament are the 27 inspired canonical books, no more, no less. And so if we looked at the open canon problem, we could put it like this. The canon is either infallibly, that is by divine assistance, right? Because all infallibility, as Braden said in his response to Gavin, is inherent to God. And what happens is when the church or any other agent exercises a kind of authority in which they can speak for God or where God uses them as his mouthpiece, it's by divine assistance. It's not in the agent themselves as if they, by their own merit and power, are so wonderful that they're infallible. No, it's by divine assistance. The canon is either infallibly or fallibly, that is by human reason. No matter how you put it, whether um, you know you might say, okay, well, I don't think the canon's infallibly closed, um, so I'm going to try to find another way to put it. But it's like, well, no, if it's fallibly closed, then by human reason. And so you might actually think that we have the correct canon of the 27 books of the New Testament or uh, the Old Testament canon that you have. But the question is, what process did you use to determine and say that that is the correct number, right? And here, if you do go down the route of the fallible human reason um, position, it's not the case that you're saying your canon is wrong. It could very well be correct, but you're just acknowledging that the process by which you closed the canon is fallible. And so it's only as strong, only as good as the arguments that are offered. And then when we talk about the canon being closed, you know, the official list of the books, we're saying it's fixed, no more, no less. It's this number exactly. All right, so I consider then three possibilities for what one might pursue. If one goes down the route of the canon is infallibly closed, there are consequences for this position. So first, it would mean that if the canon is infallibly closed, then God divinely assisted the church hundreds of years after the apostles to the truth. Now, for me as a Catholic, that sounds like music to my ears because that's exactly what I believe on so many issues that were brought up in the ecumenical councils. Hundreds of years later, God, working through the church, settled issues. And this was after the apostles. Of course, public revelation ended. That is that the apostolic deposit of scripture and tradition, what Jesus and the apostles intended us for, uh, for us to believe as divine and apostolic faith, right? De fide those doctrines, those dogmas, those beliefs, there are not any more new ones coming out. Rather, what the job of the councils is, is to simply affirm and point out what is in the apostolic deposit and making it clear throughout the history of the church so that we might be in communion with Christ through the apostles. 
And so the important thing here then is that one could say this is a kind of proto-infallibility because you're already acknowledging that even though the church and human beings are obviously fallible, somehow through the history of the church, God brought them to the correct conclusion and guided them uh, from error into truth. And so this would then be a proto-infallibility. Now, of course, uh, one might say it's not a full-throated infallibility. And I'll go into that in the next section because I did address that, I believe, in the first video uh, and even in my presentation on Reason and Theology and my YouTube channel, how somebody might say, look, I don't want to call it proto-infallibility because I don't believe that the infallibility is inherent or perpetual in the church. I'll talk about that in the next slide. The second possibility is that you say that the canon is fallibly closed. Now, if you go down this route, you have two problems. First, you could try to give arguments for why you think the books that are in uh, the canon that you have, why you think they're correct. But the problem is that it's a non-starter. It's a non-starter because isn't the canon something only God can settle? How can we as human beings say, yeah, yeah, God breathed in that book, but not in that book? I mean, th there's a sense in which it's God's prerogative to say, no, I breathed in that book. Oh, and I didn't breathe in that book. And so simply then the job of the church is to receive from God that which he has divinely breathed. And that's the job of the church. And so if we're using human reason, then it seems like we're already getting off on the wrong foot, because if we're looking for what God breathed into, that's something that I think only God can settle for us. Now, one could try to use their human reason to say, oh, well, this book maybe conforms more to our orthodox theology. And this book seems, and then it's like, okay, well, if you go down that route, right, then you have to also ask yourself the question, you know, what is the basis of the knowledge of the faith that you're claiming, right? Because um, if we are trying to establish the canon of scripture, you can't just automatically then appeal to scripture because that would be circular. What you might be able to do is construct, let's say, arguments based on uh, maybe the nature of God, that he would become incarnate, that he would resurrect, that he would do certain things. I mean, if you want to go down the a priori route, which is a very robust philosophical route that one can take, the only issue then is that that doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to get the same 27 books. I mean, for example, you have then the open canon problem where human reason can, in principle, reopen the canon, right? So suppose, for example, that one believes, okay, based on this a priori argument of the nature of God, that he would become incarnate, that he would um, die on the cross, rise again from the dead, and share uh, in this victory with other human beings, uh, I'm going to say that we have to cut out the book of James because it contradicts uh, my sola fide that I'm drawing philosophically from prior premises or my belief that salvation has to be totally in the hands of God as I understand that to what for that to mean. And so James can't be in the canon and perhaps passages where it says, you know, we have to secure our salvation, though those aren't good. And then we could even use other historical critical methods to say, or textual critical methods to say, well, you know, this book uh, or this aspect of this book doesn't belong here. That's probably not in the original, so we can cut that out. And then moreover, if you go down paleography, you could even say, well, look, this part of the book, or let's say this author doesn't write um, like Paul does, or even just looking at the grammar and the way in which the Greek is structured, maybe this doesn't look like Paul, so we keep the seven Pauline uh, texts that we think are authentic and we cut out the rest. I mean, these are all ways in which one can go if you think that the canon is fallibly closed. And so my basic position then is that you want to say that the um, canon is infallibly closed because you get into the non-starter problem where you're trying to determine the canon by human reason when it's something that God has already, that God has that privileged knowledge, if you will, to know what books he breathed in or what books he didn't breathe in. Um, and then secondarily with the open canon problem, if you use human reason to close the canon, you can use human reason to open the canon as well. And so then you could you could justify making all kinds of different canons and therefore uh, even using scripture at that point to settle doctrinal disputes would be pointless if we can't even agree on what scripture is, right? If somebody comes in with Marcion's canon and I come in with my full 27 books of the New Testament, that's going to be a problem. And even with my Old Testament, you know, that's going to be a problem if I'm arguing with someone like Marcion, right? Because then we're not even on the same page. So if one trusts tradition, 
then is that tradition infallible or fallible? So suppose somebody says, you know what, I, I don't want to play these games. I'm not going to say that God infallibly guided the church to truth hundreds of years later to find the canon. I'm not going to say that the canon was fallibly closed. Instead, I'm just going to trust that the canon that I received is correct. But then you have to ask yourself the question, is that tradition infallible or fallible? And the reason why you have to ask that question is because even if you don't want to engage the question, it still actually goes back to either option one or option two. So for example, if the tradition that you received is fallible, it was constructed by human reason, it could be in principle disproven, or it could be wrong, then what, what that means then is that you are holding to a canon that is fallibly closed, and so you face either the non-starter problem or the open canon problem. Now, if you don't want to go about trying to rationally justify the canon, but just trusting the tradition you received, then I think the non-starter problem wouldn't hit so hard, but the open canon problem, that wiggle room would already be there if you're not willing to defend that even this tradition that you received was somehow infallibly constructed, given, protected by God in some way. And this is the crucial thing because I remember uh, Gavin and other Protestants will say that, look, we have traditions. We don't mind having other legitimate authorities that help us interpret the text like our own uh, councils, our own creeds, our own um, traditions in our denominations and historical practice. We just don't say that they're infallible. Okay, here's the problem though. If you say then that the canon, a tradition that you received wasn't infallibly closed or isn't infallible without error. I know that the term infallible, I would only use for agents, but here I'll allow myself to use it flexibly as Gavin did in the debate. If you don't say that they're infallible, then the tradition that you received of the canon is fallible. And so then you get into the second problem, then the canon is fallibly closed. And so this is why I want to emphasize that if you believe that the canon is a tradition that was handed down to you, right? Then you need to believe that it was infallibly protected or else you run into the open canon problem. Or if you want to say that the tradition is infallible, but not the church, then the question is to what extent can you separate the church, you know, the bishops and the people throughout history and the, the forefathers of your faith or your particular denomination from the church how can you separate the church and the tradition from each other when they seem to be both having that task of handing on and confirming and being used by God to confirm what the canon is? And so, you know, looking at some objections then, the main strategy seems to be in response to the argument from what I've seen so far is to distance infallibility from the church. So the first objection is this isn't proto-infallibility because the church does not intrinsically or perpetually possess this charism. So my first response is that regardless of if you accept it as infallibility or what I'm simply gonna call proto-infallibility, a minimalist infallibility in fact, it is still an instance of infallibility. Let me say that again. Even if you don't accept that it's full-throated infallibility, you don't wanna call it proto-infallibility, if you believe that the canon was infallibly closed by God through the church, through the tradition, whatever, through God's people in history, then this does constitute a kind of infallibility. This is so crucial because somebody might say, well, no, it doesn't because um, the people that God used, they were fallible, but God through his providence, through the Holy Spirit infallibly closed it. And it's like, yes, even as a Catholic, I would agree that the bishops on their own are fallible that the Pope is not some kind of oracle or, you know, receives, I don't know, um, these supernatural crazy abilities, right, to be uh, without error. No, the idea is that when the church makes the final call, God will protect the church from being permanently bound from error. And so when the church puts its foot down and it says, this is the canon of scripture, and we have it, whether you know you you believe it's the Protestant canon or the Catholic canon, that doesn't really matter right now. The point is that simply, if you believe that your canon was infallibly closed, then you have to admit then that this is an instance of infallibility. So this is interesting then, uh, because the debate then between Protestants and Catholics is not, could God make someone infallible? It's not even, has God made someone infallible in history or individuals infallible in history? Or, or even individuals after the apostles, you know, has he divinely guided them to truth? 
No, no, that's not the debate. The debate is how many times did it happen? And that's crucial because this would be one instance then that a Protestant would have to say, okay, God infallibly guided the church. Um, you don't have to, I mean, I'm not saying here that you have to say it was the Catholic church necessarily, but just the church, however broadly you want to define that, God's people um, to the correct canon. And then your denomination, your particular tradition has received this truth, right? And this tradition, hopefully that you have, if you believe the canon's infallibly closed, that tradition on the canon is infallible or it's without error, hopefully, if you really go down the first option, which you have good reason to want to. So first off then, yes, this would constitute at least one instance of infallibility that we would have to acknowledge post-apostles. The second question then is why on this occasion and not others? So if, for example, if you want to say that, okay, fine, I'll allow for this one instance, but no others, because the reason why is because this instance is so crucial to get the word of God to receive the canon that God, of course, would allow this one exception. But think about it. Well, it, yes, the Bible, we agree, is essential, but why not also intervene when the church historically was facing, I don't know, disputes on Christology, when the church was uh, facing disputes and schism over all kinds of issues. I mean, isn't unity essential as well? Isn't the historic unity, the ability of God's people to come together and to accept a just authority that gives a ruling and then to say, okay, look, I don't want to break communion from you. I might disagree, but I accept the judgment. I accept the ruling. I mean, it's the same thing with like any good and well-organized political society where the court gives the ruling, the politician is elected, and we don't go out and say, oh no, the, the, the court ruling didn't happen, or uh, that politician wasn't elected. We say, look, I disagree, but I acknowledge that he is the president, or I acknowledge that that is the court's ruling. I might petition it, um, at least in a human society, right? But in a divine society, in a society on earth, in the church, it would make sense, you know, that we would be able to re retain a kind of unity that has an infallible protection to it, as we saw with the previous example of at least the canon, which was so essential being closed by God. And so the point here is simply um, with the first option, it's not to say that sola scriptura is necessarily false. Um, well, actually, this would be a conclusion then that I'm teasing out. But the point is to also show and apply pressure on someone who would only want to say that scripture is infallible, right? Uh, you would want to, ha you would have to admit one instance of infallibility, all right? Even if you don't want to say it's held intrinsically or perpetually by the church. And then we can start applying pressure then as Catholics and say, why on this occasion and not others, isn't the historical unity of the church also essential? Um, and on what basis are you saying that, for example, um, oh, that's essential and that's not, or that's essential, but that's just important, not essential, right? I mean, these are the kinds of questions we can get, we can start asking. Now, one other possibility that someone could give is something like the census fidelium, right? Or, or even there, there are Protestants who do accept some notion of the indefectibility of the church. And so the idea is that, look, the faithful have this sense that these are the books of scripture. I remember Mike Lacona, he asked, you know, uh, to the audience one time in a lecture, why do you believe, uh, somebody asked him, why do you believe that the gospel of Thomas and the Gnostic text aren't scripture? <laughs> and Dr. Lacona said, have you read them? Because as soon as you read them, you're just going to see like, oh, you know, when, when, I, when I see it, I just know it, right? And it's like, well, that might work for, you know, Dr. Lacona, respectfully, great scholar. It might work for us today, with our, what is it, 2,000 years of tradition and prior theological work. But I mean, for a Christian, right? And for Christians throughout history, uh, you know, they, they didn't have that prior luxury. And for some of them who didn't know any better, better, they had the gospel of Peter and that was the text for them that they had. Others of them thought Bar the epistle of Barnabas and the epistle of Clement were scripture, right? So the, the basic point here is, all right, when we talk about the census fidelium and we're going to say that God's people in some broad sense are almost like, if you will, organs of the magisterium, you want to know, okay, but is the census fidelium infallible or not? Does it actually have any infallible protection? And so 
somebody might say, okay, the reason why I'm using the census fidelium argument is to show it's not the church um, as the institution that's infallible. It's God's people as a whole that are infallible. So Anglicans, um, Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, right? Um, everybody's included in this, okay? And the general sense of God's people is that it's these 27 New Testament books, no more, no less. Sure, but the issue then is, are we saying that consensus is infallible? Are we saying that the census fidelium is infallible or not? And the reason why I'm really stressing this is because you need to commit to one or the other. Because if you are going to say that, for example, you know, for Aryans who are still living today or for um, other people like the Ethiopians of a different canon, they might, they might be looking at us and saying, yeah, what we believe is that we're the faithful remnant and you are like the rest of Israel that has gone astray. But we are the ones who have remained faithful with our canon, with our tradition. So if you're going to go down the route of saying the census fidelium, the consensus of Christians is really um, confirming that this is the correct canon, then I want to know, is it infallible or not? And if it's not infallible, then we go back right into the, the second horn of the trilemma, which is then either the open canon problem or the non-starter problem. And then also the question then, maybe, maybe the consensus could provide evidence, but you can't really say that that is, you know, um, what confirms the canon, right? It might just be some evidence that maybe this is the correct canon, but then you also have to embrace the possibility that it's fallible. But if you want to argue that it is infallible, right, then you can do a lot more. But then that gets you into the first option of a kind of proto-infallibility for either the church or tradition. But then at this point, then what's the distinction between the church and the tradition, if that makes sense in the argument? And so, look, if you're going to try to go down the census fidelium route, you want to know, is it infallible or not? Either option either gets you into the open canon problem, the non-starter problem, or if you go with the infallibility, you get to proto-infallibility, we can start pressing more. And then even if you try to use the census fidelium as this blanket to try and distance infallibility from the church, well, one is that, well, how is that any different than the, what, what separates the census fidelium from the church and from tradition itself, right? So either way then, you don't avoid the problem. You might just displace it for a step, but you get right back to it. And so, right, I, I have a cheeky line here where I say, you might avoid an infallible magisterium, but at the price of infallible tradition. Objection two, the canon was closed bottom up and not top down. So this is also going to be touted as a way of saying, look, the church is not infallible. Um, the, and the church by being the institution, the bishops, you know, the, the hierarchy, it's the people, it's God's people on the ground working together throughout history. And, and the problem with this objection is first, it's misleading, right? So when you look at the history of the church, it was a combination of both, I guess, everyday people and the top-down hierarchs, right? So for example, in cases in which for, uh, a congregation would be reading the gospel of Peter or the acts of John, you know, the Bishop would look at it and give the ruling if it is heretical or not, or an ecumenical council would look at the documents and then say, if it's rule, if it's a uh, heretical or if it's not. And so there's a way then in which it's not either bottom up or top down, it's both working together. And so, there was a mixture there. There was hierarchy and institution that played a role because you would have the everyday people circulating the text, reading it amongst themselves and maybe getting spiritual fruit from the text. But then it was ultimately the bishops or the bishop in the diocese or region who would give the final ruling on, okay, no, that, that's not canonical or no, that's heretical or, okay, that's safe for reading, um, but maybe don't say it's scripture, right? These prescriptions were given in the Christian record. And so, it was both bottom up and top down. Now, somebody might say, well, no, Swan, what I mean to say is that it's not top down in the sense that the church in the first thousand years gave a universal ruling that these are the texts of scripture, right? Well, you you have examples of Pope Damasus and other councils that have given their canon lists. And then you have St. Athanasius, for example, um, in his position of authority, giving the, the 27 uh, books of the New Testament that we have today. Uh, so, you do then have this sense in which, okay, maybe it's not top down and that a universal ruling was given in like an ecumenical council in the first thousand years, right? Because the ecumenical council for us as Catholics that officially closed the canon 
was the Council of Trent. But, but, and this is key, the Council of Trent was confirming a tradition that we had already received as Catholics on what the canon of scripture is. It wasn't, for example, the case that, um, you know, it wasn't until the Council of Trent that we were, uh, I don't know, um, uh, kind of grappling and we didn't read Tobit before, but now we're reading Tobit because, you know, the Council of Trent said so. No, no, no. The canon throughout the history of the church, you know, th there was some flexibility because there were local people maybe in their diocese who rebelled against their bishops, or maybe there were some bishops who thought one text was okay, one text wasn't okay. Sure. But you see that with each, let's say, iteration in the history of the church, there were moments of concentrations of order where the church did assert itself in a very clear way, what is scripture, what is not. And in that way then, um, it wasn't the case that the canon was, let's say, in uh, was fallibly closed during all that time. No, the idea is that eventually through the magisterium, the authentic magisterium, if you will, the ordinary magisterium working and pruning and moving along, eventually you do have a crystallization of the canon in tradition. And then given the indefectibility of tradition that was kept and preserved from the apostles all the way to the end of time, right? The canon was closed indefectibly in tradition, but then it was closed infallibly by the magisterium in the Council of Trent. And so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind then. The church, both in its institutions and its people, were working to close the canon. And as we see over time, it eventually was closed. And it wasn't until people began challenging the presence of certain books that these disputes began to arise. And so then the church had to give an official infallible ruling. I mean, the same is true, for example, with the Assumption of Mary. Even before Pope Pius XII declared it dogma, it was already a doctrine of the church. It was already part of the indefectible tradition of the church. It was already part of our liturgy. We already held it to be true. We already held it to be a sign of orthodoxy. But what Pope Pius XII did with his ex cathedra decree was he noted explicitly universally for the church, this is a dogma, this is in the divine apostolic deposit of the faith, and so we have to believe it. And so that's crucial when talking about bottom-up versus top-down. Right. It, it's such a common like claim to, I'm sure you heard it a lot when that's still a Baptist, but mm -hmm. the, the claim that the Catholics added these books of scripture into the canon and the Protestants were just trying to preserve the old canon that the Jews gave us. And, you know, that that's something I constantly hear uh, still within this Baptist context that I'm in at OBU, but it's also mm -hmm. something I hear in like, you know, Westland tradition. So it's, it, it's, it's funny because you you look back and see what what books were considered scripture prior to the Council of Trent, and mm -hmm. you don't get the sense that these books were just randomly added. And in the, in the Protestants saw this, and it's like, oh no, we have to go back to what was originally the case. Uh, it's it seems to be the other way around. We see that the Protestants take out these seven books that were. Uh, thought to be scripture, thought to be a, a part of the canon. And then the Catholics are reacting against this, um, taking out books of scripture. So mm. it, often it, it seems like the, 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 the formulation of the canon, the, it's, it's switched, like, like how people refer to this <laughs> event in history. It's yeah, like, it's no. a big switch. Yeah, it's like, oh, Catholics added the books. Well, no, it, it, goes, it goes back and forth. But I, I just thought mm. that I'd bring that up because it's something that I, I still hear. And uh, even even though there are um, there there are his, historians in the Protestant side who will say no, like it, hmm. they were considered scripture before they were uh, in uh, before the Council of Trent declared them to be scripture. Um, right. But anyways, I just thought I'd bring that up because it's still something that you hear today in, in Baptist circles. But. Yeah, and I should back up too because really quick, you know, somebody might say, "All right, Swan." So, um, you know, one thing to keep in mind then is. Um, if, if we have the view then, because obviously there were venerable fathers, there were, you know, like, like Jerome, for example, who were skeptical of the, um, well, you know, some people don't like this term, but the deuterocanonical books, the seven that we, that we have as Catholics that Protestants don't, um, you might have fathers here and there who dispute over the text and dispute. And as there were disputes over Hebrews and revelation, for example, right. But we recognize that eventually in the history of the church, there was a crystallization 
where the indefectible tradition was handed on and recognized and then eventually confirmed by the magisterium. But I want to I want to, you know, make clear as you were talking about Braden that, you know, it was tradition, right? That um, in a way got us the canon. Just to some concluding thoughts on this presentation. The first is that I think the best conclusion you want to take from this argument is that God infallibly closed the canon through the church, right? Uh, so then you would have to accept at least one instance of infallibility in this, if, if you follow the at least the conclusion of the argument. And therefore, you might be able to say, okay, fine, I'm sola scriptura light. So I'm sola scriptura on everything but this one occasion, right? And then, of course, if you do that, then that's going to start applying some pressure then on why just this one occasion? Why not other occasions as well? I mean, uh, as I mentioned before, and then even the fact that we agree, right? That, I mean, this would be a, an improvement in the in the dialogue itself if we could actually get Protestants to agree with us on at least one example of infallibility hundreds of years after the apostles. That would be like an incredible game changer in the conversation between us. I think that would get a lot of Protestants rethinking, wow, Maybe I shouldn't be so hesitant about infallibility. The other thing too is that to respond to people who are saying like, look, it's not proto-infallibility because I don't accept that the infallibility is intrinsic or perpetual in the church. I mean, one, one is that I, I don't want to say it's intrinsic to the church in the sense that the church somehow, you know, its human members lose their fallibility and become like oracles, right? It's not intrinsic in that way. Um, it's intrinsic and perpetual in that it's a promise, it's a gift that God has given to protect his bride on the earth and to protect her from heresy, to help her define herself against others who are claiming to be her, right? And so um, with that being said, then um, getting into a, 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 an argument then for actually the perpetual infallibility of the church, I would do an argument from like fundamental theology. Fundamental theology is really like the study of at the most basic level, like why do we have scripture? What is scripture? Uh, what is a church? You know, what are, what is revelation? Like these really basic fundamental ideas. And I asked myself the other day, Braden, you know, why do I believe that the Bible is inerrant? You know, and that's a, and that was an interesting question for me to ask and to to meditate on because, you know, I accept the infall and the inerrancy of Scripture, I suppose, because I was raised a Baptist because I know that this is the pious and good thing to believe. I believe that this is the written word of God, but it's like, but but why, right? And 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 not only that, but why would God give us a text? One, why would He give us a text? And two, make it inerrant. Why would it? Why would He give us a text? with this particular property or reality to it. And I realized that the reason why as a Catholic, but even maybe even as a Baptist, I secretly believed this was that God gave us a text that is an errant so that it can meaningfully govern God's people. Because think about how, you know, there was the, the justice, the Supreme court justice Alito, he had a pocket constitution and in Washington, D.C., he approached the original document of the first constitution and he had his pocket, you know, book out and he was looking to check and see. And somebody asked him, you know, what are you checking for? And he said, I'm checking to see if I have the original, if the wording's the same. And you see, there's a sense in which like having a text gives you a kind of security, right? That I think is important for us as human beings, because if a law or a doctrine or a rule is being established and we have public access, or at least there is the text there that we could in principle read, it gives us a kind of security, right? Which we need in order to actually be governed by the text, to listen to our pastors, to be, <laughs> to be no pun intended on the same page, right? And so that's why, you know, God gave us a text that is inerrant. But then again, um, we need help interpreting this text. And what do we do as human beings? We rely upon tradition. We rely upon oral traditions that we can trace back to the author or those who knew the authors so that we can get to the best understanding of what they originally intended or meant. I mean, we do this all the time. And for example, constitutional law, we study the statute and then we look at the surrounding documents to understand to the best extent possible what was the original meaning and intent of the document in question. So we have tradition then, and we would need that tradition to be indefectibly handed to us or else it'd be pointless.
Then the third thing we would need then is a living institution that can communicate with us, that can respond to us, and that can speak for the text and for the tradition. And so notice then that actually the reason, the same reasons why I believe in the inerrancy of the text of scripture are the same reasons or could uh, be constitute could constitute the same reasons why I accept the infallibility of the church and the indefectibility of tradition, right? In order to meaningfully govern God's people. And in my presentation in response to Gavin Ortland on reason and theology and on my YouTube channel, you know, I gave an argument about why an infallible magisterium makes a difference. And the difference is that it shows us God's utmost seriousness on the issue of unity because God did everything possible within human freedom, right? Our free will and within human nature, knowing the kinds of creatures that we are, political, rational, social animals to get us united, to help us be one. God did everything in his power short of just making us robots, right? On the Catholic vision to get us to be one. He left us behind an infallible magisterium, indefectible tradition, and an inerrant text so that God's people can really meaningfully to the fullness that is possible be governed and be united and be one. And so this is why I think it's such a powerful point to mention then that you know the argument for perpetual infallibility to the church I think you could get something like that from how we believe that God has breathed right into the text of scripture so that we have this inerrant text that can govern and unite us, but that we need other things to help us really appreciate and honor the word of God. And so that's a way in which you can get to, I think, perpetual infallibility to the church. Good stuff, Swan. Well, thank you very much uh, for presenting on the Open Canon Argument. I hope that this was beneficial to you guys. Uh, again, if you guys have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. Uh, check out uh, Swan Sona's channel in the description below, Intellectual Catholicism. Uh, do you have any any more thoughts before we end the, the recording? No, I, I just hope that um, people will kind of, maybe this will clarify right what the argument is actually doing because it's applying pressure on, you know, you want to affirm that the canon was infallibly closed. Right. And if you go down that route, then you have to admit one one time right. <laughs> of infallibility time? in the church. And yeah, and if, only this if one you time. Use this logic for this one time, then why can't you apply that logic to these other times? And yeah, for sure. Right. I think it's going to get the ball rolling. That's my hope with this argument. Um, for sure. And I, I want to give a shout out to my friend um, Ben Bollinger on uh, Facebook, good Orthodox friend of mine. He actually praised the argument when I presented on your <laughs> channel. And so it meant a lot to hear an Eastern brother uh, say that. So I appreciate you know, all of our Eastern brothers and sisters. Mm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's, it's important what you, what you said towards the end that, you know, infallibility is not like some magic trick that you can, that the church gets to pull out whenever they want to uh, impress the Protestants or impress the world. It's, it's, it's more of like a guardrail. It's more like God is, is preserving this deposit of faith that he's given to the church and that he's, uh, he intends for us to um, be able to uh, draw on for, for faith and for practice. So infallibility is such an important uh, aspect of the, the Catholic faith. And I'm very excited, obviously, as a uh, candidate uh, being confirmed this Easter uh, to have uh, dr draw more on the church's tra tradition and um, just live more of the Catholic life. And um, yeah, so it's, it's going to be an amazing gift. And I'm very happy uh, that we had this time together. Swan, thank you very much. Uh, you're a genuine guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, go check out Swan's channel if you haven't. Uh, we hope that uh, by our learning the faith, your faith was strengthened as well. Uh, have an amazing day, and we'll see you guys next time.